class in this video go over chapter one in your textbook so the welcome to economics so um let's go over what is economics so you guys all know about the stock market and that's part of the reason why you are taking economics right now think about hey i want to make some money from stock market hey that's great um but that is not economics um that is actually the study of finance um but if you're interested uh, the, the study of finance is actually based on the study of, of economics. But don't, don't tell your finance professor, they're going to hate me for this one. Okay, so but economics. So economics is the study of how humans make decisions in the face of scarcities. So think about situations where, you know, in your personal life, you know, you want a, a bigger house, better cars, more video games. But does our society have enough resources? to give everybody what they wanted, right? So can we give everybody bigger house, better cars, and more, more video games? We certainly want to, but we don't have that enough resource. So how do we manage this scarce resource? And that is called economics. And the condition of scarcity is whenever you don't have enough resources for all the demand in the economy. So the study of economics is really study about the decision making process, either as an individual consumer, individual business, or for the country as a whole. But one perfect example of scarcity: think about homelessness. Right? You know, I'm, I'm, I, my house is next to the downtown Houston area. Uh, there are a lot of homeless people in my area. That's a big problem for many major cities in America, right? So one reason is that we don't we don't have enough enough uh, resources. To build houses for everybody so there are people who are currently unable to get a home and that's why many of them they're they're homeless so uh, but that's a certain topic for your sociology class which also has conditions in economics um one of the most famous early day economists uh, his name is adam smith and then for adam smith in, in 1776 he published his most famous work uh, it's called the wealth of nations and in the Wealth of Nations, which is one of the early uh, work in economics, he introduced the idea of division in labor. Um, so it's really saying that, you know, some laborers are good in one type of production, while the other laborers are good in other type of productions. So while at the time, that was a very radical idea uh, that most, uh, because if you think about back in 1776, um, most people were still, you know, occupied by farming, uh, by basic Handy works, right? So uh, there wasn't that much a need for specialized labor because the production itself wasn't very complex that almost everybody can handle it. Um, but, you know, soon after 1776, we saw the Industrial Revolution where many factories um, formed and then where the specialization in labor was becoming, uh, you know, more into fruition. And then what that really made into our, um, you know, economic uh, environment is that, you know, if you guys remember what you learned in your U.S. history class, um, Ford and, the, and then the Model T, that was a division of labor, right? Because what really made Model T, um, the production for Model T special, more special than everybody else, is that Model T was the first production that introduced this assembly line into mass production. That workers are no longer working on every single part of production, but they only specialize in one part of production, and they become very good at it, and therefore the company are more more efficient to produce more goods and services. So this this is what we call the division of labor, in which the um the way in which different labors uh, divide required tasks into to produce uh, goods and services. So if you look at many productions in the economy today, uh, most manufacturers, uh, most service industries, they all have this division of labor existing in the manufacturing process. All right, so um, so specialization by definition is when workers or firms focus on particular tasks for which they're well suited within the overall production process. Um, so we have that today. Um, and then today for our US economy, the with specialization that your final product tend to be produced by different companies uh, and then even tend to be produced by different countries. So think about the, the cell phone you have in your hand right now. So that cell phone has part coming from all over the world and that is called a specialization. So for economics, um, there are two different types of economic studies. They're called a microeconomics and a macroeconomics. 
So microeconomics, this is normally um, noted as Econ 2302, is study of the economy on the smaller scale. So we study the economy for individual households, individual consumer workers, individual business, uh, individual industry. But for the macroeconomics, so 2301, we study the economy on the bigger scale. So information variables impacting the entire economy, such as your unemployment rate, uh, which is you know how many people are, who are unemployed in the economy. We study inflation, the change in price level, um, interest rates, um, money supply. So factor impacting the entire economy, that's called a macroeconomics. Now for macroeconomics, later on toward the end of the semester, we're also going to study different type of government policies. So um, there is something called a monetary policy. It's when the government uses the interest rate, uh, money supply to influence our economy. That's called a monetary policy. And that tend to be conducted by the central bank of each country. Now for US, if you're interested, the central bank of America is called a Federal Reserve. So if you guys look at the $1 bill you have, look at the $1 bill. Uh, so <clears throat> on the $1 bill, of course, you have, you know, on top says United States of America, but on top of that, it says Federal Reserve note, right? So Federal Reserve is the central bank in America, which control the money supply, which is how our government conducted our monetary policy. Because how much money we have in the economy can impact our economic conditions. So we're going to talk more about this in the, in the future chapters. Um, and the next something called a fiscal policy. So fiscal policy is whenever the government by itself is either spending money or changing the tax policies, right? So either spending more money in the economy or reduce how much tax we collected from the economy. Those two policies approaches can also impact our economic outlook. And that's called a fiscal policy. And that's usually conducted by the, by the legislatures. So in America, that's conducted by our U.S. Senate, U.S. Congress, that's by our um, tax policies and also our government budget. Another famous economist you guys are going to hear a lot in 2031 is a guy named John Monar Keynes. Uh, he's very famous for his Keynes view of economics. Um, so this was made popular in the 1930s. Um, whenever the economy goes through depression, um, John Bernard, Bernard King says, um, because the economy slowed down, that the private market by itself is insufficient to consume all the supply. Uh, therefore, government should play an active role to pick up uh, to pick up whatever is left over after the private market. So government become become more involved in the economy. And if you guys remember what you learned in your U.S. history class um, in the by President uh, FDR um, introduced the New Deal. So that New Deal is this Keynes view of economics in actual practice. Because the New Deal, that's when the government decided to spend more money, increase production, uh, hire more people, increase employment. So that's the Keynes view of economics. When the economy slows down, the government should play a very active role. But we're gonna talk more about this in the future chapters. Um, so also know, so we're going to study a lot of theories. We're also going to, um, so theories are a simplified representation of two or more variables interact with each other. So economics in the real world are very, very complex. So if you look at anything happening in the economy, they are more than likely happening as a result of many different variables. So if we study the real world economy um, just by how it interact, it's going to be a little diff diff difficult, especially for the for the introduction level courses. So um, for this class and also for 2302, then we're going to simple down the economy. Uh, so we're going to assume many variables wouldn't change and then only looking at one or two variables. So many of the information you learn in this class for this semester will be all based on economic theory. So something that have a can have an application in the real economy, but keep in mind there are many other variables involved. So for example, right? So if we say, hey, look at the demand for ice cream, uh, that's driven by the price level. Well, it's true, right? Because how much the price is will determine the, the overall demand for the ice cream. But there are also so many other variables can impact the demand for ice cream, right? So weather, uh, personal preference, flavors, location, but 
we're not studying all the other variables, only studying the prices here. So that would be a theory, right? So assuming everything else doesn't change, only one or two variable change, that's a theory. So for economics, we're gonna use many models to test our theory. And then you're gonna see how this model and theory works in the later chapters as well, okay? So the first model we're gonna study in this class is called a circular flow diagram. So this diagram is this little circle thing in front of you. What it shows you, it shows you how money and resources flow in the economy. And then for this um, diagram, so let's suppose we have a question asking, um, between household and firms, which one is on the demand side? Now you might be telling me, hey, of course, household on demand side, because household, we actually buy stuff from companies, then we're on the demand side. But that answer actually depends on which market we are looking at. So there are two types of market. We have market for goods and services, and then we also have market for labor market. So in the good and service market, you're right. The household, we're on the demand side. So we demand goods and services from the company, and then in return, we're gonna pay them with money and revenues. But in the labor market, household, we are the labor market. We are the labor, right? So household, as individual workers, we're gonna supply our labor, and then firms will be demanding the labor from individual household and workers, right? So between supply demand on and also firm and household, we trying to supply demand. Remember that and the question is very very tricky. So think about which market we are looking at. So for the good and service market, then that will be the household on demand side. But for the labor market, will be the firms on demand side. There are three types of economies. Um, the first one is called a traditional economy. So for traditional economy, this is typically based on agriculture. Um, and it is the oldest economic system and it's primarily used right now in Africa, uh, Asia, Central America, uh, South America. And then this tends to be a very small family, um, family economies that each individual family owns a field and they're gonna produce the goods and services, actually farm good, and they are most tend to be you know, self-sufficient. So whatever they need, they can produce by themselves on their farm. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the second one, it's called a command economy. In the command economy, you're gonna have the government play a very, very active role controlling every single aspect of the production process and also the consumption process. So by definition, it's the economy where economic decisions are passed down from the government authorities and where the government owns the resources. So if you look at some of the, um, the communist countries in the world, so your old Soviet Russia, your Cuba, your North Korea, they have the command economy where the government owns all the resources, government hire all the workers, and therefore government control every single aspect of the production process. And that's called a command economy. Uh, China used to be a command economy, but after the you know they opened up the economy back in late 1970s, so today China is not an entirely command economy anymore. But they still have big part of the government that's involved. There are still many big industries in the country that's owned by the government, and governments still hire a lot of people. So they, they, their economy is more like a mixture economy. So there are some, some aspects that belong to the command economy, and other aspects belong to our third category. which is our market economy. So market economy is where the economic decision process are decentralized. So, so individuals, companies, um, families owns the resources, and then they're also in charge to produce the good and then supply the good in the market based on the demand, right? So the government is no longer involved in this market now. Um, so by definition, market is whenever you have a, a physical place or even online location where you're your buyers and sellers come together to interact. That's a market. So that's where the demand meets supply. And then another definition, private in, private enterprise. So a system where private individuals or groups of private individuals owns and operate, operating the means of production. So many companies in America are private enterprise, right? So they're owned by individuals or a group of individuals. The government doesn't own the companies. 
again, compared to the command economy, government owns those companies. But in market economy, it's individuals own the economies. So for most economies in the world are mixed. Uh, we mentioned before the China economy is mixed. U.S. economy is also mixed. That we have um, big party economy is on the market economy, but still there are portion economy that's on the command economy. The government owns some part of the process. Um, all right, so there is no absolute free market on uh, the government. The, uh, the least government can do is to offer regulation because with no regulation, then, then there wouldn't be a very good economy anymore. Um, so there are some regulations that we absolutely need. So think about regulations on um, safety measurement, right? So uh, your safety belt, um, your car seat, right? Those will be the regulation by the government. Also regulations on pollutions, right? So that's another regulation. So even though government is not actively producing the good, but government is actively regulating the, the production process. So there are economies out there that offer few regulations than others. Uh, for example, if you look at many of the developing economies, so in many poor countries, they, ten they tend to have a lower regulations than many of the more developed countries, right? So there are productions that you can do in other countries, but you cannot in, let's say, US and Europe. That's because of regulation. And I also know what's an underground economy. Uh, so underground economy is whenever um, the private enterprises are, are engaging in illegal activity that shouldn't happen, try to circumvent the regulations by the government. And that's called an underground economy. So imagine if you try to, let's say you want to sell something, uh, but you don't want to pay taxes, and that will be called an underground economy. Okay, so something illegal that's circumventing the, the regulations. All right, also know also globalization. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about this in the later chapters. So globalization is when you have the trend uh, that buying and selling in market that are increasing crossing national borders. So what we're producing, are sold in other countries, and what we're consuming here actually produced in other countries. So export is something produced in America, sold in other countries, it's called export. U.S. we're exporting a lot of farm goods, so corn, soybean are exported from U.S. market. And we import is whenever you would, we buy stuff from other countries that's produced overseas. So go to Walmart, almost everything in Walmart are made uh, overseas in China, and those are called import. Um, the to look at how good the economy is, we're going to look at something called a GDP. It stands for Gross Domestic Product. And you guys probably heard this before. So GDP measures how good the economy is. So every time GDP is high, that means the economy is good. Every time GDP is going down, that means we're in trouble. So, um, you know, a, a measurement of, you know, how good the economy is, uh, look at if we're in, in either a recession or depression, we're looking at our GDP. So if your GDP is decreasing for two consecutive quarters for six months, we're in a recession. And if GDP is going down for four consecutive quarters, we're in a depression, right? So that's how we use our GDP for. So like a temperature check to see how good the economy is. One thing to look at the, the extent of the globalization, uh, look at our seaport. Now in Houston, we're next to the second largest seaport in America, the Port of Houston. Um, so during the pandemic, now, Houston was doing okay, but if you look at the pandemic, um, in the biggest port in America, the Long Beach Seaport uh, in uh, Los Angeles, there were a huge backlog of um, of the um, the transport ships, the, the cargo ships. They couldn't dock because the port was full, right? So, so this really shows the import-export for the country. All right, guys, so that's it for this chapter. Uh, have any questions, let me know, and I will see you guys for the next chapter. Bye-bye.